Hi, my name is Brian Droidcor. I'm an editor at Art in America, where I run a weekly email newsletter called The Program about art and technology. And this is a conversation series where I talk about people who are doing exciting things in that field. Today, I'm talking to Nani de la Pena, who is a journalist and the founder of Emblematic Group, which is a digital media company that produces VR experiences primarily in journalism, but also other fields. Thanks so much for joining me today, Nani. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Yeah, um, so I am kind of interested in, you know, journalism isn't a topic we uh, cover that much in an art magazine, but um, I'm just sort of curious to get your uh, perspective on uh, things that are happening in this field and how VR is being used to tell stories. Um, I know you've been working as a journalist for, for some time since you were a reporter for Newsweek in the 90s. Um, what do you think is the social role of journalism today and how have you seen that change? So, um... Journalism is going through very interesting, interesting, uh, you know, I want to say transition, although sometimes bordering on crisis. And um, there are a lot of things happening at once. On one side of the spectrum, you have the fact that um, there's a lot of reckoning going on in uh, major news organizations because they've, they're, they're realizing that they didn't really report on their communities because so many communities of color were left out of their storytelling. Um, and that's been really uh, a lot of um, very important self-reflection going on. On the other side, you have um, uh, basically local news going under and it's being now taken over by uh, organizations that aren't journalistic organizations, but have a particular political ideology and they're representing themselves as being journalism organizations. So that's even in some ways uh, a little bit more insidious than um, uh, what I would call um, fake news because people are um, uh, uh, deeply aware that on Twitter or some of these other Facebook, it's become pretty clear that those places can spread fake news, but local news is super trusted. So these are two really big things, right? And now when you go into what does it mean to be social, you have to kind of address both spectrums. What does it mean to do stories that matter um, about for both your local communities and in an international global piece? This image that we're looking at here um, was my attempt to try to understand what, how you would do an embody statistic, how you would have people on scene and see data. Um, and in this case, I was talking about all the Syrian children who were killed uh, during this, the Syrian um, uh, conflict. And um, these were, you know, basically like ghostly figures representing the number of kids who um, were being affected. Uh, Assad uh, was targeting children to get at their families, uh, which is unfortunately a very similar scenario that we've seen play out in America uh, with immigrants and, and separating children from their parents. It was used as a deterrent. Um, and um, yet, uh, uh, so this was a very, very early visual that I did. Um, I don't think we even had GoPro cameras yet to start to make content that put people on scene um, for real stories that were unfolding. So as I understand the first, um work you did like this was a recreation of Guantanamo Bay in 2007. You did it in Second Life to talk about the experience of detainees there. Um, how did you kind of get started in, in this virtual, um, working with virtual environments? This would be a good moment for me to just share screen because I got a little bit of imagery up on that. So in 2003, I made this documentary uh, called Unconstitutional that I directed about all the civil liberties violations post 9-11. And uh, got a grant alongside an artist named uh, Peggy Weil. I had said to her, called her up, a digital artist, old friend, and said, you know, Gitmo still um, around. You know, this is now four years later. Uh, well, I guess more like six years later for the prison camp with no, you know, no judge, no trial, no nothing. And um, uh, she said, well, what about Second Life when we started talking about putting people on scene? And so we made a virtual, accessible version of Gitmo. Uh, in contrast to the real but inaccessible prison camp. <clears throat> and we we're very careful about making sure that we stuck to the journalism. On the left is a photograph of how detainees were being brought to the camps. And on the right, your avatar was asked to give up its control. And then we would 
quote unquote, you know, put you in the same bound like position. And then, and then let me show you what happens next. As soon as I had put on my orange jumpsuit, I was thrown into the back of a C-17 transport plane and... You are immediately bound, and then a black hood comes over the vision of your avatar. Shut up! Oh. We then integrated some sounds that were based on descriptions of what real detainees heard. When the black hood is removed, you find that you're in a cage. Most of the footage is from original Defense Department shots of detainees in Guantanamo Bay. A replica of Camp Delta will be added to this camp X-ray soon. Noni wants it to include a habeas corpus game, enhancing the simulation of a place outside of the law. Like a regular video game where you get your choices. What do you do now? Call your parents? Call your lawyer? Ask what you're in here for? And the answers are, no, you can't call your parents. No, you can't call your lawyer. Sorry, not allowed to give you that information. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea on that project. Um, so was there resistance to the use of CGI and these kinds of recreations in documentary and journalism? Oh my God, I got so much pushback. <laughs> I had so many of my colleagues finger in my face. You can't do that. Um, I, when I started making Hunger in LA um, in 2010, I had been working as a research fellow at USC in the journalism school. And the director who supported me left and um, the rest of the department got into a very big conflict about me and I lost my job. Wow. So it was pretty brutal, actually. Those were probably some of the worst years ever of um, uh, when I was making Hunger in LA, which is the image that you've got up here now, which puts you on the side of a food bank using real audio uh, during the create recession where people were just so many families uh, were trying to get food. And this, in this case, this man with diabetes didn't get food in time and he collapsed into a diabetic coma. So you're seeing kind of a composite here to show you what we built below and on top is the real church that they were outside of trying to get food. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think it was Hunger in LA that kind of sort of helped crack things open, but in the meantime, <laughs> Oh my God, there was one night where I managed to feed my kids and there was $2.99 in the bank and I, I didn't have enough money for food for myself. It was really brutal. I'd never had experienced such insecurity ever in my life and um, that was it. But I stuck with it. Now so that was the work that like elicited some really strong reactions at, at Sundance when you showed it, right? This piece really established that this medium was effective for creating a connection with these virtual stories. Mm -hmm. um, we put people on scene uh, at this food bank thing and she's now down with the seizure victim. It's something I call duality of presence where even though she's in this huge contraption and she can see out of both sides um, uh, of that gear, she still is trying to talk to the seizure victim. And I saw this over and over again, people trying to touch the seizure victim, speak to them, comfort them begging people you know, who aren't gonna move the digital characters to do something, it was pretty crazy. Wow. What do you think is the, are some of the most effective means you use to elicit empathy? Is it about the um, environment you're creating, the storytelling? I saw you had um, a kind of video game interactivity in the, the Guantanamo experience. Um, I mean, what are some of the, the tools you use that you, you rely on to tell these stories and, and make people you know, make those connections. Well, I think this, the hunger piece is a good example because <clears throat> I knew that that food were run, food was running the food banks were running out of food, right? And these lines would be huge, and you can't see in this image, but there are a lot of kids actually in in this line in the front, etc. But um, and I was like, oh my god, if we get audio of a moment where they basically a family is being told, and this was happening a lot, I knew already. Uh, where a family's being told, like a mother's being told, I'm sorry, we're out of food. And she's standing there with her kids. What does she do? What does that sound like? What is it like to be unseen at the moment when a mother can't feed her kids uh, or parent, right? And, um, but what I was finding was that the gravity of it, rather than people, they would just, they would just go silent. And, um, and again, I'm, I, at that point, there's no GoPro. I'm trying to recreate this all with digital characters. 
And I knew the audio was crucial. Um, and then I had an intern working with me and we we're both out recording stuff at food banks. And she came back with a crucial audio to this piece and it conveyed everything, it conveyed everything. The woman in front of the food bank, she's overwhelmed by the number of people. And she's shouting, there's too many people, there's too many people. This whole crazy thing happens where this man goes into a diabetic coma. And then in the chaos, another woman is, tries to start stealing food and she's trying to stop that too. And it conveyed everything of what was going on at food bank. So to me, the story there was what drove the piece, um, but, but having all that action around you in that embodied form is what made this a different kind of experience, an experience that connected you to an event that you might've driven by in your car or walked across the street from, or didn't really pay attention to. And in this case, you had no choice. You're standing there witnessing this as it happens the way any journalist would have. And I, that was my goal. I wanted to remove the barrier between the viewer and the scene to somehow make the journalists more, you know, more uh, uh, transparent and, and let the audience connect more directly with what was going on. Now, I don't have a VR headset. I usually encounter VR experiences at galleries or museums. And I'm, and I'm wondering, like, where is the audience for this work? I mean, we, we saw you, you presented it at a Sundance Film Festival. Where else do people encounter this and how do you um, expect that to, to change? So um, the headsets are starting to become more commonplace. Uh, the Quest headset uh, has been a bit of a game changer in that it doesn't require a computer. And so it's 300 bucks. And now you're, um, you're able to you know, have really great extraordinary experiences. Um, but what we did even with this piece um, is we started making a WebXR version. So this is a, this is a piece um, uh, that puts you on scene in Greenland and we can have a embodied time lapse where you're watching a huge glacier melt, right? So this is a really important story about connecting to these scientists who are doing the work. And, um, you know, we used a 360 camera to give us some of the real views and then we had to rebuild it virtually. Um, and, and the reason why this is important is it lets people stand on scene and, and, and feel like they're there and the science isn't just being made up um, and it makes that connection. But the problem again is the distribution issue that you've brought up. So we've been working really hard on what we call WebXR. Um, in fact, this morning we just got a grant that just got grant for the web that was just announced for $100,000 to help us release a tool that lets you make content just with buttons called reach.love. And reach.love lets you not only make content just with buttons so you don't have to code, like I had to learn how to do, but also it shares as a URL link. So that means you can look at it on your phone, you can look at it on the computer, and if you have a headset, you just hit a button and you can start walking around the scene. So recognizing the friction and not only in terms of being able to experience the content, but also I really wanted underserved communities to have access to the tools because it's been such a, um, you know, economically really has benefited a very slim uh, demographic. And I wanted to try to stop that before this medium begets so widespread and becomes commonplace. And before Apple releases its headset and before, um, you know, I mean, I saw a crazy one that I think was uh, Panasonic, really light, amazing glasses. Before all those come to the market, I don't want underserved communities to be eliminated from the storytelling. I want them there. And so that was one of my goals behind Reach.Love to make it so anybody can start telling important stories uh, or whatever they want to say. Um, uh, in the platform. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Are there any recent projects you'd like to share? Um, so, yeah. So I think um, just to kind of show you um, how we had to deal pivot with some things um, uh, for COVID, there are two things that we worked on this summer that were kind of amazing. 
Uh, one was a 360 series of films on uh, young female teenage activists. And I think if you watch the one on Brazil, um, it has uh, the most uh, amazing shot of um, that I think you're almost gonna ever see in 360. So I recommend you go to the Lenovo site and find that series. Um, but in the short term, I also wanna show you a kind of crazy thing we did with an Italian fashion brand where um, we use what we call virtual production, um, which is lighting, in-world lighting, in-world cameras and Unreal. Okay, so I'm gonna show a bit of the, the opening and then uh, as I said, and then I'll skip to the end. But because people couldn't gather in Milan, this was our solution. You know, down to the strings moving, right? In the virtual world, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are clothes that were modeled uh, digitally, is that right? That's correct. Everything had to be made digitally in a, something called like Marvelous Designer. And let me just go to some of the in clothing for you too. So we had to, you know, we had to, um, create all the characters. The clothing had to be separately Fitted, animated, it was an unbelievable amount of work. Hand, handmade work. I'm gonna show you the last couple of looks because they're so beautiful. And then uh, we can stop. out of the designer but that that last shot crashed our computer for three days oh my god that, <laughs> that carousel coming up out of the ground so we really you know the clothing itself had to be fitted separately animated separately put onto the body separately the lighting had to be done differently each camera shot had to be rendered it was an unbelievable amount of work but i think uh kind of groundbreaking so and i that's always fun okay well thanks so much for sharing your work with us today all right, I really appreciate that you've uh, you've given me so much time to talk to you.